Chapter 19, in which a notable plan is discussed and determined on. It was a chill, damp, windy night when the Jew, buttoning his greatcoat tight round his shriveled body and pulling the collar up over his ears so as completely to obscure the lower part of his face, emerged from his den. He paused on the step as the door was locked and chained behind him, and having listened while the boys made all secure and until their retreating footsteps were no longer audible, slunk down the street as quickly as he could. The house to which Oliver had been conveyed was in the neighborhood of Whitechapel. The Jew stopped for an instant at the corner of the street and, glancing suspiciously round, crossed the road and struck off in the direction of Spitalfields. The mud lay thick upon the stones, and a black mist hung over the streets. The rain fell sluggishly down, and everything felt cold and clammy to the touch. It seemed just the night when it befitted such a being as the Jew to be abroad. As he glided stealthily along, creeping beneath the shelter of the walls and doorways, the hideous old man seemed like some loathsome reptile, engendered in the slime and darkness through which he moved, crawling forth by night in search of some rich offal for a meal. He kept on his course through many winding and narrow ways until he reached Bethnal Green, then, turning suddenly off to the left, he soon became involved in a maze of the mean, dirty streets which abound in that close and densely populated quarter. The Jew was evidently too familiar with the ground he traversed, however, to be at all bewildered either by the darkness of the night or the intricacies of the way. He hurried through several alleys and streets, and at length turned into one lighted only by a single lamp at, a farther, at the farther end. At the door of a house in this street he knocked, and... <clears throat> having exchanged a few muttered words with the person who opened the door, walked up the stairs. A dog growled as he touched the handle of a door, and a man's voice demanded who was there. Only, only me, Bill. Only me, my dear, said the Jew, looking in. Bring in your body, said Sykes. Lie down, you stupid brute. Don't you know the devil when he's got a greatcoat on? Apparently, the dog had been somewhat deceived by Mr. Fagin's outer garment, for as the Jew unbuttoned it and threw it over the back of a chair, he retired to the corner from which he had arisen, wagging his tail as he went, to show that he was as well satisfied as it was in his nature to be. Well, said Sykes. Well, my dear, replied the Jew. Ah, Nancy. The latter recognition was uttered with just enough of embarrassment to imply a doubt of its reception, for Mr. Fagin and his young friend had not met since she had interfered on behalf of, in behalf of Oliver. All doubts upon the subject, if he had any, were, however, speedily removed by the young lady's behavior. She took her feet off the fender, pushed back her chair, and bade Fagin draw up his without saying any more about it, for it was a cold night and no mistake. Miss Nancy preferred prefix to the word cold another adjective, derived from the name of an unpleasant instrument of death, which, as the word is seldom mentioned to ears polite in any other form than as a substantive, I have omitted into this chronicle omitted in this chronicle. It is cold, Nancy dear, said the Jew, as he warmed his skinny hands over the fire. It seems to go right through one, added the old man, touching his left side. It must be a piercer if it finds its way through your heart, said Mr. Sykes. Give him something to drink, Nancy. Burn my body, make haste. It's enough to turn a man ill to see his old, lean old carcass shivering in that way, like an ugly ghost just rose from the grave. Nancy quickly brought a bottle from a cupboard in which there were many, which, to judge from the diversity of their appearance, were filled with several kinds of liquids, and Sykes, pouring out a glass of brandy, bade the Jew drink it off. Quite enough, th quite. Thank you, Bill replied the Jew, putting down the glass after just setting his lips to it. What? You're afraid of ge you're afraid of our getting the better of you, are you? inquired Sykes, fixing his eyes on the Jew. Ah! With a hoarse grunt of contempt, Mr. Sykes seized the glass and emptied it, as a preparatory ceremony to filling it again for himself, which he did at once. The Jew glanced round the room as his companion tossed down the second glassful, not in curiosity, for he had seen it often before, but in a restless and suspicious manner which was habitual to him. It was a meanly furnished apartment, with nothing but the contents of the closet to induce the belief that its occupier was anything but a working man, and with no more suspicious articles displayed to view than two or three heavy, bludge heavy bludgeons which stood in a corner, and a life preserver that hung over the mantelpiece. There, said Sykes, smacking his lips, now I'm ready. "'For business, eh?' inquired the Jew. "'For business,' replied Sykes. "'To say what you've got to say. Or "'So say what you've got to say.' "'About the crib at Chertsey, Bill,' said the Jew, "'drawing his chair forward and speaking in a very low voice. "'Yes, what about it?' inquired Sykes. "'Ah, uh, you know what I mean, my dear,' said the Jew. "'He knows what I mean, Nancy, don't he?' "'No, he don't,' sneered Mr. Sykes. "'Or he won't, and that's the same thing.' Speak out and call things by their right names. Don't sit there winking and blinking and talking to me in hints as if you weren't the very first that thought about the robbery. Dang your eyes. What do you mean? 
Hush, Bill, hush, said the Jew, who had in vain attempted to stop this burst of indignation. Somebody will hear us, my dear. Somebody will hear us. Let him hear, said Sykes. I don't care. But as Mr. Sykes did care upon reflection, he dropped his voice as he said the words and grew calmer. There, there, said the Jew coaxingly. It was only my caution, nothing more. Now, my dear, about that crib at Chertsey. When is it to be done, Bill, eh? When is it to be done? Such plate, my dear, such plate, said the Jew, rubbing his hands and elevating his eyebrows in a rapture of anticipation. Not at all, replied Sykes coldly. Not to be done at all, echoed the Jew, leaning back in his chair. No, not at all, rejoined Sykes. At least it can't be a put-up job, as we expected. Then it hasn't been properly gone about, said the Jew, turning pale with anger. Don't tell me. But I will tell you, retorted Sykes. Who are you that's not to be told? I tell you that Toby Crackett has been hanging about the place for a fortnight, and he can't get one of the servants into a line. Do you mean to tell me, Bill, said the Jew, softening as the other grew heated, that neither of the two men in the house can be got over? Yes, I do mean to tell you so, replied Sykes. The old lady has had him these twenty year, and if you were to give him five hundred pound, they wouldn't be in it. But do you mean to say, my dear, remonstrated the Jew, that the women can't be got over? Not a bit of it, replied Sykes. Not by flash Toby Crackett, said the Jew incredulously. Think what women are, Bill. No, not even by flash Toby Crackett, replied Sykes. He says he's worn sham whiskers and a canary waistcoat the whole blessed time he's been loitering down there, and it's all of no use. He should have tried mustachios and a pair of military trousers, my dear, said the Jew after a few moments' reflection. So he did, rejoined Sykes, and they weren't of no more use than the other plant. The Jew looked very blank at this information, and after ruminating for some minutes with his chun chin sunk on his breast, raised his head and said with a deep sigh that, if Flash Toby Crackett reported aright, he feared the game was up. And yet, said the old man, dropping his hands on his knees, it's a sad thing, my dear, to lose so much when we had set our hearts upon it. So it is, said Mr. Sykes. Worse luck. A long silence ensued, during which the Jew was plunged in deep thought, with his face wrinkled into an expression of villainy perfectly demoniacal. Sykes eyed him furtively from time to time, and Nancy, apparently fearful of irritating the housebreaker, sat with her eyes fixed upon the fire, as if she had been deaf to all that passed. Fagin, said Sykes, abruptly breaking the stillness that prevailed, is it worth fifty shiners extra if it's safely done from the outside? Yes, said the Jew, suddenly rousing himself as if from a trance. Is it a bargain? inquired Sykes. Yes, my dear, yes, rejo rejoined the Jew, grasping the other's hand, his eyes glistening, and every muzzle in his face working with the excitement that the inquiry had awakened. Then, said Sykes, thrusting aside the Jew's hand with some disdain, let it come off as soon as you like. Toby and I were over the garden wall the night before last, sounding the panels of the doors and shutters. The cribs barred up at night like a jail, but there's one part we can crack, safe and softly. Which is that, Bill? asked the Jew eagerly. Why, whispered Sykes, as you cross the lawn... Yes, yes, said the Jew, bending his head forward with his eyes almost starting out of it. Mph, cried Sykes, stopping short as the girl, scarcely moving her head, looked suddenly round and pointed for an instant to the Jew's face. Never mind which part it is. You can't do it without me, I know, but it's best to be on the safe side when one deals with you. As you like, my dear, as you like, replied the Jew, biting his lip. Is there no help wanted but yours and Toby's? None, said Sykes, except a center bit and a boy, the first we've both got, the second you must find us. A boy, exclaimed the Jew. Oh, then it is a panel, eh? Never mind what it is, replied Sykes. I want a boy, and he mustn't be a big un. Goodness, said Mr. Sykes reflex reflexively. If I'd only got that young boy of Ned, the chimbley sweepers, he kept him small on purpose and let him out by the job. But the father got lagged, and then the juvenile delinquent society comes and takes the boy away from a trade where he was earning money, teaches him to read and write, and in time makes apprentice of him. And so they go on, said Mr. Sykes, his wrath rising with the recollection of his wrongs. So they go on. And if they'd got money enough, which is a providence they have not, we shouldn't have half a dozen boys left in the whole trade in a year or two. No more we should, acquiesced the Jew, who had been considering during his speech, and had only ca caught the last sentence. Bill, what now? inquired Sykes. The Jew nodded his head towards Nancy, who was still gazing at the fire, and intimated by a sign that he would have her told to leave the room. Sykes shrugged his shoulders impatiently, as if he thought the precaution unnecessary, but complied, nevertheless, by requesting Miss Nancy to fetch him a jug of beer. "'You don't want any beer,' said Nancy, folding her arms and retaining her seat very composedly. "'I tell you I do,' replied Sykes. "'Nonsense,' rejoined the girl coolly. "'Go on, Fagin. I know what he's going to say, Bill. He needn't mind me.' 
The Jews still hesitated, as Sykes looked from one to the other in some surprise. "'Why, you don't mind the old girl, do you, Fagin?' he asked at length. "'You've known her long enough to trust her, or the devil's in it.' "'She ain't one to blab, are you, Nancy?' "'I should think not,' replied the young lady, drawing her chair up to the table and putting her elbows upon it. "'No, no, my dear, I know you're not,' said the Jew, but—' And again the old man paused. "'But what?' inquired Sykes. "'I didn't know whether she mightn't perhaps be out of sorts, you know, my dear, as she was the other night,' replied the Jew. At this confession, Miss Nancy burst into a loud laugh, and, swallowing a glass of brandy, shook her head with an air of defiance and burst into sundry acclamations of— keep the game a-goin', never say die, and the like, which seemed at once to have the effect of reassuring both gentlemen, for the Jew nodded his head with a satisfied air, and resumed his seat, as did Mr. Sykes likewise. Now, Fagin, said Miss Nancy with a, life, with a laugh, tell Bill at once about Oliver. Ah, you're a clever one, my dear, the sharpest girl I ever saw, said the Jew, patting her on the neck. It was about Oliver I was going to speak, sure enough. <laughs> what about him? demanded Sykes. "'He's the boy for you, my dear,' replied the Jew in a hoarse whisper, laying his finger on the side of his nose and grinning frightfully. "'He!' exclaimed Sykes. "'Have him, Bill,' said Nancy. "'I would if I was in your place. "'He mayn't be so much as up, he mayn't be so much up as any of the others, "'but that's not what you want if he's only to open a door for you. "'Depend upon it. He's a safe one, Bill.' "'I know he is,' rejoined Fagin. "'He's been in good training these last few weeks, "'and it's time to he began to work for his bread. "'Besides, the others are all too big.' "'Well, he is just the size I want,' said Mr. Sykes, ruminating. "'He will do—' "'And he will do everything you want, Bill, my dear,' interposed the Jew. "'He can't help himself. "'That is, if you only frighten him enough.' "'Frighten him?' echoed Sykes. "'It'll be no sham frightening, mind you. "'If there's anything queer about him when, when we once get into the work, "'in for a penny, in for a pound, "'you won't see him alive again, Fagin. "'Think of that before you send him. "'Mark my words,' said the robber, "'shaking a heavy crowbar which he had drawn from under the bedstead.' "'I've thought of it all,' said the Jew with energy. I've, "'I've had my eye upon him, my dears. Close, close. "'Once let him feel that he is one of us. "'Once fill his mind with the idea that he has been a thief, "'and he's ours, ours for his life. Huh. "'It couldn't have come about any better.' "'The old man crossed his arms upon his breast "'and drawing his head and shoulders into a heap, "'literally hugged himself for joy. "'Ours,' said Sykes. "'Yours, you mean?' "'Perhaps I do, my dear,' said the Jew with a shrill chuckle. "'Mine, if you like, Bill.' "'And what?' said Sykes, scowling fiercely on his agreeable friend. "'What makes you take so much pains about one chalk-faced kid? "'When you know there are fifty boys snoozing about Common Garden every night, "'as you might pick and choose from.' "'Because they're of no use to me, my dear,' replied the Jew with some confusion. "'Not worth the taking, for their looks convict them when they get into trouble, and I lose them all. "'When this boy properly managed, my dears,' With this boy properly managed, my dears, I could do what I couldn't with twenty of them. Besides, said the Jew, recovering his self-possession, he has us now if he could only give, his, give us leg bail again, and he must be in the same boat with us. Never mind how he came there. It's quite enough for my power over him that he, is a, he was in a robbery. That's all I want. Now how much better this is than being obliged to put the poor little boy out of the way, which could be dangerous, and we should lose by it besides." "'When is it to be done?' asked Nancy, stopping some turbulent ex exclamation on the part of Mr. Sykes, expressive of the disgust with which he had received Fagin's affecta affectation of humanity. "'Ah, to be sure,' said the Jew. "'When is it to be done, Bill?' "'I planned with Toby the night after tomorrow,' rejoined Sykes in a surly voice, "'if he heard nothing from me to the contrary.' "'Good,' said the Jew. "'There's no moon.' "'No,' rejoined Sykes. "'It's all arranged about bringing off the swag, is it?' asked the Jew. Sykes nodded. And about, oh, ah, uh, it's all planned. Rejoined Sykes, interrupting him. Never mind particulars. You'd better bring the boy here tomorrow night. I shall get off the stones an hour after daybreak. Then you hold your tongue and keep the melting pot ready, and that's all you'll have to do. After some discussion, in which all three took an active part, it was decided that Nancy should repair to the Jews next even, evening, when the night had set in, and bring Oliver away with her. Fagin craftily observing that, if he evinced any disinclination to the task, he would be more willing to accompany the girl, who had so recently interfered on his behalf, than anybody else. <coughs> it was also solemnly arranged that poor Oliver should, for the purposes of the contemplated expedition, be unreservedly consigned to the care and custody of Mr. William Sykes, and further, that the said Sykes should deal with him as he sought fit as he thought fit, and should not be held responsible by the Jew for any mischance or evil that might befall the boy, or any punishment which it 
with which it might be necessary to visit him, it being understood that, to render the compact in this respect binding, any representations made by Mr. Sykes on his return should be required to be confirmed and corroborated in all important particulars by the testimony of Flash Toby Crackett. These preliminaries adjusted, Mr. Sykes proceeded to drink brandy at a furious rate and to flourish the car crowbar in an alarming manner, yelling forth at the same time most unmusical snatches of song mingled with wild execrations. At length, in a fit of professional enthusiasm, he insisted upon producing his box of house <clears throat> his box of housebreaking tools, which he had no sooner stumbled in with and opened for the purpose of explaining the nature and properties of the various implements it contained and the peculiar beauties of their construction than he fell over it upon the floor and went to sleep where he fell. Good night, Nancy, said the Jew, muffling himself up as before. Good night. Their eyes met, and the Jew scrutinized her narrowly. There was no flinching about the girl. She was as true and earnest in the matter as Toby Crackett himself could be. The Jew again bade her good night, and bestowing a sly kick upon the prostrate form of Mr. Sykes while her back was turned, groped downstairs. Always the way, muttered the Jew to himself as he turned homewards. The worst of these women is that a very little thing serves to call up some long-forgotten feeling, and the best of them is that it never lasts. Ha! <laughs> the man against the child for a bag of gold. Beguiling the time with these pleasant reflections, Mr. Fagin wended his way through mud and mire to his gloomy abode, where the Dodger was sitting up impatiently awaiting his return. Is Oliver a bed? I want to speak with him, was his first remark as they descended the stairs. Hours ago, replied the Dodger, throwing open a door. Here he is. The boy was lying fast asleep on a rude bed upon the floor, so pale with anxiety and sadness in the closeness of his prison, that he looked like death, not death as it shows in shroud and coffin, but in the guise it wears when life has just departed, when a young and gentle spirit has but an instant fled to heaven, and the gross air of the world has not had time to breathe upon the changing dust it hallowed. Not now, said the, said the Jew, turning softly away. Tomorrow, tomorrow.'